Y'all planning for this? Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Perfect RIA Podcast. I am delighted to welcome Alan Moore to the show. Of course, I think virtually everyone has to know who Alan is, though I'm surprised, Alan, when I meet people who don't know who you and Kitsis are. I like meet advisors in the industry, and I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to Alan Moore, and they're like, Alan who? And I think we just we just have to stop this discussion right here. Like, If you're not that connected to the industry, we need to stop. But how are you doing today, buddy? I am doing awesome. And, and it's funny you say that. I use Kitsis as the litmus test for me. Like a reporter who's never heard of Michael, I'm like, we don't need to be talking right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do you know what money is? Like, have you heard of dollar <laughs> bills? <laughs> I have been very happy to be in the the background while, my, while Michael has been sort of the celebrity of, of the industry. But uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Well, speaking of you and Michael, give us a step back. How long has it been now since the two of you started XYPN? See, we started in April of 2014. So it's been eight and a half years now. It's the longest relationship I've ever had because it's longer than my oldest kid. And we met on Twitter. Of, of all places, you know, so, online dating. Love it. Exactly. For all you financial advisors that are out there, the, I think we're the only ones keeping Twitter alive. It's us and the bots. So go hang out on Twitter. It's amazing who you meet. And and ultimately, that's how I met Michael, got teamed up and, and got started in business eight and a half years ago now. That's phenomenal. And of course, XYPN does a host of things now, an ever growing list, but really kind of your niche is advisors who I, I guess I don't let me put words in your mouth, but you really kind of grew out of like in 2014, in that period of time, the only way really to get started in the industry was to join a wirehouse or to join an insurance agent. Like there were some guys starting RAs from nothing. That's a short list. Most people it was like sell. And if you survive selling the, that minefield, then maybe you can do something else. Right. Yeah. I, I like to say that we ultimately, our, our mission is to help advisors start, run and grow their own RIA. So whether you're starting from scratch, your career changing into the industry, or you've got it really our bread and butter are folks who have eight to 10 years of experience in, in an RIA or a broker dealer. They're, they're looking to go on their own. They're part of the failed succession plan. You know, they mm. were promised equity, never got it. Yep. And, and are looking to get started. And so, you know, a, a median, the, the median age of a member is about 40. Interesting. Which sort of follows our, our trend of, you know, X, Y comes from Gen X and Gen Y looking at, at bringing sort of a service model to next gen clients. But it's really for advisors who want to be independent. They want to, to build their own business, but they don't want to do it alone. As you've as you've experienced, uh, entrepreneurship is a lonely journey. Some of us are wired for that. Some of us are wired to just go figure it all out ourselves and tinker with every piece of software. I find most advisors are not. They just want to do good financial planning, and and their firm doesn't support that. And so the the path to entrepreneurship becomes sort of the the right path for them. I love that. One of the things you mentioned, Alan, that I found really fascinating with what you've been able to do with XYPN is you mentioned that it's very lonely to be an advisor. It's very lonely to be an entrepreneur, especially in the independent space. It feels like the community that you and Michael have built at XYPN is really unmatched anywhere else in the industry. Right? I've been in the industry now, by I hate to admit, like 20 years, almost 20 years. And uh, you know, I've been to a lot of industry events. We won't need to name any of them, but it's still very isolated. There's sort of like the group of people on stage pounding their chest, and there's sort of the rest of us milling around, almost like an awkward high school prom. But at, at least at XYPN Live in your community, it's very tight-knit. Would you talk to us a little bit about how you did that or how intentional that was? Yeah, I mean, we we joke that people join us for the the technology and the discounts and the compliance, but the the reason they stay members are is because of the community. I think so many of us got tired of going to the you know shall not be named industry events and yes. feeling like we were the only one. I just used to joke. I mean, I'm I'm 35 now, and I still feel like I get a I, I sit at the kids table when I go to industry events because yeah. there's a handful of us under 40. You know, and so I, I just feel like that's one of those things where, you know, when you wh- whether it's joining XYPN or just coming to XYPN Live, you don't have to be a member to come. Uh, that's our national conference every year. It really is just about surrounding yourself with people who who think differently, who who don't necessarily share all your same beliefs, but are willing to hear that you're trying to do things differently. You know, it wasn't too many years ago if you were out talking about surge meetings, everyone's like, that's just crazy. You know, but they right. don't even that's want to right. engage in that conversation. Or uh-uh. you know, we were out saying, hey. I think you can profitably work with 30 year olds. And you're like, no, you can't. That's absurd. And just getting around folks who are willing to say like, oh, you're trying like a gym membership group class model in finance. Like, let's talk about that. Or, hey, you're trying to do this cool thing in, in the employer space. Like, let's talk about that. And just trying to get around folks who, who are, again, are, I would say probably at their core, who view this as a helping profession and not as a sales industry is just a fundamental shift in, in the people, why they got into the business, and ultimately who they want to hang out with. Yeah, I love that. I was at XYPN Live last year. And I have to confess, for a lot of years, I thought, oh, it was really only for XYPN members, even though that wasn't your marketing, right? That was just sure. my false impression. 
But yeah, I highly recommend it. Whether you're XYPN or not, wherever you're at in your career, I've met, in fact, one of my friends in my mastermind, Ben Verwise, he's a longtime XYPN member, runs a massive firm. That's one of his favorite conferences to go to because, as you pointed out, Alan, people are so transparent. They're so willing to try things. Like you said, a, a gym membership model. No one's at a, well, we won't name conferences, talking about, hey, maybe I right. need this gym membership model. Like People are thinking outside the box everywhere. And if nothing else, we wear shorts and T-shirts and flip-flops to the conference, which our, our first ever conference, we had a vendor uh, who everyone would know. And the folks were really upset because they had to go buy clothes because they had only brought suits. They had to go buy like T-shirts and, or I guess they ended up with polos so they could split the difference. Really, that's at the core of who we are, where we really want to create an inclusive environment where if you want to wear T-shirts and you've got tats and, a, and color hair, sweet. If you want to wear a suit because that's your jam, I'm good with that too. Michael's always in a suit. So, you know, really come be yourself and, you know, come to a conference where you can really learn and network with people again, who who are willing to think differently like you are. Alan, shifting gears just a little bit, you've now seen, I mean, firsthand data on hundreds, probably thousands of of practices. What are some kind of common threads or things that people should watch out for or, or lessons that people learn the painful way? What are some things that come to mind for you? Yeah, it's been really exciting. Every year we do an, an annual benchmarking survey of XYPN members. And really, it's the only survey that's solely focused on advisors who are doing a fee-for-service model, primarily a, a monthly or quarterly subscription fee. Wow. And, and the data has been just absolutely amazing. And a couple of the things that we have learned, one is that experience does matter. All right. And I'm the kid who started a firm at 25 years old. My, my major professor in college jokingly, seriously said, said more confidence than skill. And he was right. Right. I had all the confidence in the world, didn't know yeah. what I was doing. But experience matters. That It is really hard to just truly start from scratch. Never be, especially if you're like mm-hmm. 22, 23. We're like, please don't start a firm. Like, go go get some experience. But experience matters. The CFP is is a good proxy for that experience. I'm not going to tell you if you get CFP, you're you're destined to, to be rich. But like, it is a it is a huge value add. And the second thing we that we find is that niche matters and having a really clear idea of who your target market is, because you know all the questions in the world. How should I, you know, what's my service model? How much should I charge? Should I do surge meetings? Like, should I like what are the value adds that I want to be able to to provide? It, they're totally different if you work with. You know, my, my two examples, like Chick-fil-A franchise operators like Pando Wealth out of out of uh, Georgia, or if you want to work with, you know, like Meg Bartelt out of uh, Washington working with women at pre-IPO tech companies. The value adds, the things you talk about, the service model, the fee structure, they're just totally different. And so we always want to, I think, start with like, well, I'm going to do monthly subscriptions and therefore this is going to be my service model. And I wonder who, who this works for. And what we find is that the, the firms who are willing to just say, put their stake in the ground, say, this is who I work with. This is the only person I work with. And everyone else I'm going to refer out to an advisor who that's who they work with. We see they grow faster. They earn more, the higher fees per client. They spend less time per client. And they're self-reported delivering higher value and more value to those clients. So that, that's the other big thing that I highly recommend. Yeah, that's interesting. When we talk about niches a lot in the industry, right? But I liked your point about we've got to be really clear who we're not going to work with, right? It's it's uh, early in our careers. We were even guys later and gals later in their careers. It's really easy to say this person wants to work with me. I know I can deliver massive value to them, but if they're not part of my niche, it, it won't work. I love to use the example. I have a client who's a retired cardiologist. We'll call him Bob, and I say, Hey, Bob, did you ever in your career did you ever do a knee replacement? And he he had this look like. This is the most insane question I've ever asked. He says, of course, I never did a knee replacement. I said, but Bob, didn't you learn about that in medical school? He said, yeah, I did a whole residency or whatever on, on orthopedics. And I said, well, why didn't you ever do it? He, says, he, he was just like dumbfounded by the question. He said, no, all I did was hearts. That was it. That's all I do. And for advisors, we have to, I think, be that almost pig-headed. Like, listen, all I do is Chick-fil-A owners. All I do are retirees in my geographical area. All I do are Australian ex- expats, if you're our friend Ash Murphy. Like, if you're Adam Schmieler, right, all I do is optometrists at independent spaces. Y- you've got to have the commitment. But, Alan, in your experience, how do you get the confidence to do that, right? It's easy for you and I to say with established businesses, cool, I can turn away all this business. It's not a good fit. But when you're young, at least young in your career, how do you do that? How do you get there? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, now we have the data to show that the firms who are putting their stake in the ground around a niche are growing faster, even in the early years. It used to be the opposite, actually, that if you were a generalist year one and then into year two was a little faster because you kind of got the family and friends pop. Sure. What I think we're seeing now, well, what we're seeing in the data is that firms are are coming out of the gate much faster, but they're also working to build up their credibility in their niche before they're launching. And so they're getting a bit of a head start. 
But ultimately, if you look at the fastest growing firms in, in XY Planet Network and across the industry, they're all niched. I mean, they, they just are very clear about who they serve. I look at, I think, our probably one of our fastest growing firms, it's not the fastest, it's Brooklyn FI out of Brooklyn, working with you know uh, folks with stock options inside tech companies that are IPOing and they do tax returns. Like They're bringing on some like 14 clients a week right now. I mean, they wow. are exploding. And it's because they are so clear on who they work with. Their processes are all about stock options. You come into come to them for social security analysis. Shane and AJ don't don't. They probably forgot how to do it. This is not what they do. They send somebody who that's their their specialty. And so, really convincing. A lot of it is just using data to try to convince these advisors. But I get it. Like you want to take every client you can to make you know to to make ends meet. And which is why we encourage like don't put yourself in a financial position if you're launching a firm where you have to take those clients to make ends meet. Try to give yourself a little bit more runway, a little bit more padding. But ultimately, it's, you know, you only get 75 to 100 seats on the bus. If you're going to be a solo, let's say you get yep. 75 seats on the bus. And for every seat you give away to the to the wrong person, that's a it, it's the wrong client on the bus. It's also the wrong person referring you new business because they're going to refer their fam- their friends and, and their network, which is outside of your niche. The more mm-hmm. times you have to say no to people, and, and eventually it's a relationship you're going to have to terminate if you really want to to get your firm to where they're going to to, to its maximum value. And so it's taken a long time, but we're now starting to see more and more firms adopting that philosophy out of the gate and and building the business that ultimately allows them to scale that way. Yeah, I love that that insight. Yeah, it, it's just so tempting. I think maybe back in a previous era of our industry, when like you said, it was all just about selling. It really and, and it was about products, right? Yeah. So it didn't matter the service model. It was like if I can sell this loaded fund, if I can sell this annuity, this whatever, then I can sell it and I can walk away and go sell the next thing. It was okay to sell to everybody. I, okay, in as far as a business building, right. not not as a value standpoint. But today, yeah, if you're taking on people all over the place, you just can't deliver value to them consistently. You'll never get to any kind of scale. Even if scale is seventy five people, you'll just never get there. Yeah, I agree. And it used to be your niche was geographical region, that yes, my office yeah. was the closest to you as the client. And therefore, it, we made that work. I mean, in, even pre-COVID, but especially with COVID now, you know, if you get diagnosed with a, a very rare form of cancer, like, are you going to your family practitioner? Are you going to the oncologist at the local hospital? Or are you finding the expert in that particular, you know, that particular cancer so that you can go get the, the best treatment? And I, I'll fly across the country to go get the best treatment, you know? And so that's what, what we're starting to see more and more, especially as these larger firms like your Schwab and, and Vanguard and such, they are starting to encroach on our space. They are starting to do financial wow. planning and, and niche firms are not concerned about Schwab coming in and taking their clients. The generalist advisors who do a little bit of planning and some basic ETF models, they're, they're terrified and they should be. You know, it also makes yourself very difficult to differentiate, right? So let's use that Schwab Vanguard example, right? If if you're saying, hey, I, I just provide financial planning for everybody, whatever that vague term means, yep. and the prospect's looking and saying, well, Vanguard and Schwab, they provide financial planning for everybody at a much lower cost, almost free, and in some cases, they're paying the client to come on board. That's a really tough one for the prospect to differentiate. But in contrast, if you say, hey, I only work with Chick-fil-A franchise owners, like that's my bread and butter – that makes it a, if you're a Chick-fil-A franchise owner, you at least want to talk to that person. Yeah. Like, what does this guy know that these other people don't know? And you've just got to be there, especially if you're doing any kind of content creation, right? If you're doing podcasts, if you're doing blogging, your videos, whatever it is, if you're trying to speak to the whole world, you will never get anywhere. If you say, boy, only just this very narrow thing, you've got a chance. Totally agree. Yeah. And, you know, we get caught up thinking of niche as just profession. And mm-hmm. but it, there's a wide range of options. I mean, we we have members that uh, we have one that that only works with strippers. We have another one that works with online sex workers. You know, do you think those clients are are going to Vanguard and Schwab to like have a conversation about how they make money and and what to do with all the cash they're generating and like all yeah. like no, they want someone who speaks their language, understands who they are, uh, what they're looking for. But everyone can niche, and you may not necessarily know your niche, and and you can learn into one if you ultimately pick one and, and want to become an expert. You may you know ultimately select niche based on lived experience and having uh, expertise there. But I don't know anyone who that's a downside. It's always a benefit. You know, the only time I'm trying to think that's now you mentioned that anybody whose niche has gone astray. I know a couple of advisors that pick niches where they had no inroads and they had no expertise. I, I know that I felt guilty of that. Like, hey, I want to work with 401k plans. All right, well, I know nothing about 401k plans and I don't have any inroads there. And really the key point was I wasn't willing to commit to create either of those. So you can't necessarily wish yourself into a niche. That's fair. 
It is not if you build it, they will come. That is not the case. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I dream about a niche. The only other case I've seen it gone wrong was an advisor picked a niche that there wasn't a profitable way to service them. Yeah. It just it, it was more like this is where you should be spending your philanthropic time. Like you should do a pro bono day. Like Friday should be your pro bono day and serve this niche. They desperately need your help. The other four days of the week, you need to serve a niche that you can do profitably. But other than those really obscure examples, Alan, I can't think of any times where niches have gone astray. Yeah, I mean, I, I see firms shift niches. I did the same thing. I, I got my CDFA and worked with two divorcing couples and was like, and we're done. Like, I was not built for this work. Yeah. You know, I, I thought I wanted to do that. I did not. Like, it's okay to pivot niches. There, There's a learning curve. You know, I think of, uh, we've got one advisor who used to specialize just in working with Olympians and has expanded to more like professional athletes that includes sure. Olympians. It, it's okay to keep pivoting and be agile. But in the end, again, if there's one piece of advice I, I can give folks, especially if you're thinking, you know, I get the question, well, how, what would you do if you're five years or 10 years out from starting a firm? It's get really clear on who you want to serve and start building that network because you can build into almost any network with enough time and energy. Totally. You can get those inroads, but it sometimes it takes five to 10 years. So start now. Well, and I, I think, especially in the XYPM community, but the advisor community in general is becoming more open. There's somebody else who's working in that niche. And it might not even be an advisor. Like I was at the AICPA conference a few weeks ago. I sat down with a CPA who's on the other side of the state from me and his entire CPA from their four offices, all they do is work with farmers. That's it. That's their niche. They're in rural America. Well, cool. If I wanted to get into the farmer niche, that would be a great guy to talk to because he's very passionate about what he does. He understands that most advisors can't serve this, and I'm not a threat to him. Like me learning yeah. about his niche, that's not going to impact his accounting practice. The same with our industry. If you say, well, I want to get into professional services. Cool. I'm going to reach out to Adam Schmiel and learn how he serves optometrists. I'm going to pay for some of his time and then see how I can adapt that to a different niche. Right? The market's so big. Like Even the most obscure niche has more people than any of us could ever serve it's so true. Yeah. We, we have one firm that did the same thing with, with Meta CPA firm that specializes in working with volunteer firefighting companies, which I didn't know was a thing, but it's only a thing in like two states, Pennsylvania being one. Oh, you know, I met that guy at XYP and I, yeah. I forget his name, but yeah. But like, that's a niche to, to be able to expand. Now, I, I didn't even know volunteer firefighting companies existed. I thought they were just volunteer nonprofits, but the, yeah. they're not. Like to your point, you can get really obscure, but really finding those people who are already, you know, either in the niche or even advisors. I mean, it, I talked to, you know, folks like Zach Toich, who works with progressives in D.C. He's just like hungry to find, try to find people to refer clients to because he can't take all the business that he's generated. And so if you're out in, in there and you're just like, I really can't pick a niche, like I really just I don't know where I have inroads. It is OK to say like, hey, you know what? I'm I. I if you're like extremely conservative, I wouldn't try to work with progressives, like sure, sure. line up with your values, but like try to line up and, and say like, okay, what are some of the, the, the areas I think are interesting, build that expertise, build the net, you know, build a network with the advisors already serving those clients. Yeah. A way to do this, but we could tangent on this all day is if there's niches you're considering, right, whether it's divorcees or progressives or farmers or whatever it is, find out who's going to be at the next conference. I feel like I'm just plugging the XYPN live yeah. conference because I, I love the conference, right? I would look and say, right, who's attending this conference that has some kind of that exact niche or a similar niche? Uh, again, people going to that conference are very open. They're willing to share. I'd find that guy or gal and say, great, can I buy you a beer? Can I tell me what you love and what you don't love? Alan, to your point about divorcees, you might discover like, that's not my niche. Like that's just yeah. not where I thrive. Maybe entrepreneurs is, maybe, maybe it's not. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's a great. Yeah, so often we go to a conference and we just sort of show up. Like, I wonder who the keynotes are. You know, it's like make a plan. If you're going to spend the time, I mean, your most valuable asset. I mean, you, you talk a lot about this. Like, your most valuable asset is your time. And so, if you're going to spend the time and money that it takes to go to a conference, even if it's you know a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, you're taking three or four days away from your family, away from your business. Like, make a plan and and be really clear on what are the what are the wins I want to get out of here. I want to talk to these particular these three vendors because I saw they're on the exhibitor list. Yeah. I want to hear this keynote and I want to talk to these five advisors because they have a thing that I think I can learn and. Quite frankly, if you only do one of those things and only learn one thing, it was probably worth the time. But but be really right. intentional so that you know when you walk away from a conference, was that a successful event or not? Because, you know, I, I think about it from the flip side, every exhibitor in there has metrics of success that they mm -hmm. know if it was a successful conference or not based on people they talked to, business cards yeah. they collected, and then and ultimately sales at the end of the event. As an attendee, you should have the same sort of mentality because just like the exhibitors are paying to be there, you're paying to be there and you should walk away with that tangible value. Totally. 
I was, like I mentioned, I was just at the AICPA conference, and Alex, one of the lead advisors in my office, he and I went down together. And as we got to the tail end of the conference, he says, Jarvis, did you actually make it into any sessions? Did you make it into any sessions? I said, I got to confess, I didn't make it into any sessions. I spent the entire time looking. There was advisors I wanted to connect with. I found them. There was speakers who were giving presentations, and I looked at their presentation ahead of time, and I found them when they were done to ask my specific questions. Alan, to your point, I knew that Holista Plan was going to be there. I wanted to talk to those guys, so I found them when they were at a lull. So I, I love your point. Like You need to be as intentional about those gaps as you are about the agenda itself. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Alan, as we – again, I really appreciate your time today. As we think about conferences or niches or just financial planning in general, what are some action items that our listeners can take away? What are things that you're like, man, if I could tell everybody this thing, every advisor this thing, what would some of those be? Yeah, I'll, I'll switch away from niche because people get tired of hearing me sure. uh, hearing me say it over and over. I think one thing I would really encourage advisors is that my definition of financial planning is that we help people live their great lives. We're the only profession that actually asks people, what do you want out of life? And then helps them build a li- build that life that's their dream. And I think too often we don't do that as financial advisors. And so I encourage advisors, I, I always agree, you should have a therapist, a business coach, and your own financial planner. Because those are the the professionals who are going to help you be sure, are you living your own great life? The beauty of financial planning is you can build the business, whatever that is, whether it's solo, whether that's a boutique, whether it's an enterprise and a large firm, you can build a business to support your great life. Be sure you build the right one. When you build the wrong one, you will regret it. But be really intentional about what you're building and and be really intentional about the the way you're ultimately living your life. Because I think that's something that we miss out on. We think, oh, well, because I'm solo, I, I can never take a vacation. We would never encourage our clients to be like, oh, let's sign up for something that you never get a day off. So like, what can we do to build that in so that you can take a day, a week, 12 weeks for parental leave, a month long sabbatical, those sorts of things. Get really intentional. So if if there's nothing else you do, like go out and hire those professionals, again, a therapist, a business coach and a financial planner, because in the end, that's going to be the team that helps you achieve your own great life. I love that. Yeah, that, that be intentional resonates so much. One other thing I want to draw from what you said is watch out for those things like that. I don't want to call it victim language. That sounds a little too harsh where you're sort of disempowered. We're saying like, I can't do X. Well, why not? Like, let's break this down. There has to be people who are doing what you're doing and do X. So time off, yep. surge meetings, value adds, whatever that is. What if I had to do that? Who could help me find that? I love that. So it was have a coach, have a therapist, have a financial advisor. Absolutely. Physician, heal thyself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Alan, I appreciate so much your time. Appreciate really everything that you're doing for the industry. I know that XYPN is a is a great company in its own right, but I think you guys move the needle for the industry in a lot of good ways. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. Well, until next time, happy planning. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. Information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. <laughs> <laughs>